so now we move on to the next area which is the metropolitan area networks so we talk about how to do wireless over long distances and the first example of that is WiMAX and the first part of that is physical layer and then we move on to the next lecture in the MAC layer so in this part we will talk about what is WiMAX how is it different from the previous attempts and um, what is the file layer and then some parts of the file layer different parts of the file layer so what is WiMAX? WiMAX is a combination of Wi-Fi and the cellular networks Wi-Fi gives you very high data rate and cellular networks give you very high mobility and distance. With cellular networks you can go kilometers away and be covered with one tower and you can be driving in a car. So WiMAX does both. It takes the best of the cellular world and the best of the Wi-Fi and does that. So with WiMAX you could have one tower that could light up many houses in the whole city it could give you internet in the car it could connect multiple campuses um, and you can also use WiMAX for the for going you know from tower to tower theoretically you could go up to 50 kilometers okay so if you were to plot the data rate versus uh, mobility Wi-Fi would be stationary. Wi-Fi doesn't really allow too much mobility. Right? Um, so while the cellular allows a lot of mobility, by mobility is defined as three different kinds of mobility, stationary, nomadic, and vehicular. Stationary is really clear. Nomadic means walking, and vehicular is driving. So cellular, um, can cover all of those, Wi-Fi doesn't cover any of those and WiMAX covers all of those and at high speed. So WiMAX is one of the latest, actually today we cannot say that it is the latest because something else has come up in the last two, three years, LTE that we will talk about later. But WiMAX has one of the latest things in wireless technology so we have talked a little bit more detail about what are the latest things first of all it doesn't work on a fixed band so 11 works on 2.4 cellular networks work at you know some particular frequencies like you know 19 megahertz or you know 1900 megahertz and so on and so forth this one works at whatever band almost you can give it 2.3 gigahertz 2.5 gigahertz 3.5 gigahertz every country has a different allocation and WiMAX can work on that one and then it doesn't have a fixed spectral width every standard before this or most standard before this had fixed spectral width most of the cellular networks as you will see had fixed bandwidth so you need to give 30 kilohertz or 400 kilohertz or some amount of bandwidth 11 requires how much anybody knows how much 11 requires how much is 11 channel 20 megahertz right so that is fixed in WiMAX, it's not fixed. You could have any size channels. It could be 1.25 and any multiple of that. So you could have 2.5, you could have 5, you could have 7.5, you could have 8.75, you could have 10, you could have 20, all the way up to 28 megahertz. It has very strong security. We knew from 11 that security is a big issue. <coughs> so it has very strong security. It's an open technology like Wi-Fi. Unlike cellular, cellular is a closed technology. It is owned by one company. This one is open so that um, there is not one company which controls the whole technology. Reach and mobility is like cellular but high data rates. So it can reach, you know, kilometers away and can you can drive but the rates are very high. So how about these rates, when we say that it covers 70 megabits, it gives you 70 megabits and covers 50 kilometers, they are not together. You get one or the other. So if you go very far, you get lower rate. If you come very close, you get higher rate, right? So there's a data rate versus distance trade-off. So depending upon how far you are, we can give you more bits per hertz. So that's what it is basically. We might use 64 qualm if you are very close. If you are very far, we will have to use BPSK. BPSK gives you one bit per hertz. 
64 quam gives you 6 bits per hertz. So after non-line of sight operation, so this is one of the first new things is that you can be behind a building and it will still work. And a strong quality of service, guaranteed service data rate, voice and video and so on and so forth. So this basically takes the best of what is known today in wireless. So previous similar attempts, so there were other attempts back in 1998 and 2000 to offer uh, metropolitan wireless service, but they all failed. One of them was called LMDS, another one was called MMDS. LMDS stands for Local Multipoint Distribution Service. And it used 28 gigahertz band. 28 gigahertz band and that basically it used 1.3 gigahertz to give you enough bandwidth. See the thing is if you want to offer some service then you really need lots of bits. And how do you get lots of bits? One easy way is to get lots of hertz. So they use 1.3 gigahertz, but and 1.3 gigahertz you cannot get at in the lower band. I mean you cannot just get 1.3 gigahertz in one gigahertz band because that will take away the whole spectrum. But at higher bands, you can easily get that much. So they use 28 gigahertz. However, the problem with 28 gigahertz is it is affected by rain. So every time it rained, the signal, the service will go away. So during the rainy season, your internet doesn't work. People didn't like that idea, so they didn't. So basically, it died. Another attempt was to avoid that spectrum. MMDS was done. MMDS is multi-channel, multi-point distribution service. This used only the, the lower band, like 2.5 to 2.7 gigahertz band, which does is not affected by rain. But it didn't have. It was limited to line of sight. If you went behind a building, obviously you couldn't use it. But so obviously it was not designed for mobile. It was designed for more like a DSL service where you connected to a home. And you had to really set up the antenna so that there is a clear line of sight, any tree could not block it. So many houses could not get the service because you know they didn't have a clear line of sight. Um, and installation of antenna required so much money and, and that you could not really get a cheap service. So if somebody most people will not pay more than twenty, thirty dollars a month for internet service and um, they would not pay for more than 20, 30 dollars for installation. So if you need to send a truck to install something, obviously you lost the money right up front. And um, so that was one thing is installation costs were too high. And both of these things are avoided by WiMAX. WiMAX does not require line of sight. WiMAX does not use 28 gigahertz and it is succeeding. Okay, so today, today's news actually, before just coming, I read the news was saying that the the company which offers WiMAX in, in USA sell uh, the clear wire. Clear wire is just, you know, is making good money and they have lots of connections and so on and so forth, good reachability. But the but the problem here in the United States is only one company, clear wire, is authorized to offer this service and so it is going to come very slowly. And um, it is much more successful in countries like India, Taiwan, Korea. <coughs> in India, BiMAX actually is probably the most reliable service you can get, more reliable than wired DSL, because wired DSL is cut off. People steal the wires or something like cut the wires, and your service is not very reliable. But they cannot cut the wire less. As long as your antenna is protected, you are OK. So BiMAX is successful so far in that sense, although the new technology which is called LTE has come in and we will talk about that later on and that is what is being adapted by the cellular companies. So whenever cellulars are in charge, they are not offering WiMAX service. So AT&T and Verizon are waiting for LTE while, um, while WiMAX is being offered. So actually WiMAX was being offered by Sprint initially but um, the stock market basically said if you're going to use invest money on the new technologies like this it is very risky so we can't let you do that spend the stock went very much down and finally they had to give up and form a give it to a new company form a new company called clearwire which is now offering the service and nothing to do with this print i mean something to do with this print sprint owns part of it but it's not directly affecting you know sprint so Clearwire is also funded by Google and Intel and other companies. So it's a joint operation. 
So anyway, so here um, the cellular companies are waiting for LTE to come. So WiMAX, WiMAX is not 802.16. WiMAX is 802.16 actually, just like any other IEEE standard. IEEE standard is much bigger, right? It offers many, 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 many offer options. And once the standard comes out, then the industry gets together. And that is what WiMAX, WiMAX is the name of the organization WiMAX Forum to be exact, which is making the products, I mean, which is like basically standardizing the products, let me put it this way, they're not making the product, but this is a group of vendors who got together and said, let's simplify 802.16. So WiMAX stands for Worldwide Interoperability for Microwave Access. This is WIMAX. And so there are 420 members um, and they get together every three months and then discuss all these standards and they list they, they set the list of options that everybody must implement and then they check out for interoperability so the interoperability test is started in November 2005 and if you go to their website then you will find all the vendors or all the manufacturers whose equipment has been certified to be WiMAX compatible it's just like Wi-Fi if you buy something with the WiMAX logo on it you buy from two different companies, they will still work together, all right? So if you buy so just two IEEE 16 devices, they may both satisfy IEEE 16, but they may not talk to each other because they both selected the options which are different, right? So here, everybody has to implement certain options and they have to work with each other and they're tested for it. So that's what WiMAX Forum does. So, what are the bands that WiMAX supports? Well, 3.5 gigahertz band, there are certain frequencies. Um, and uh, based upon that, you get almost up to 200 megahertz. Um, and uh, some of them are um, paired. Two times five means two pairs of five um, kilohertz. Um, so this is not used in US. And uh, 2.5 is in USA, and here we have um, about 16.5 uh, megahertz plus six paired spectrum, total 194. Then there's a 2.3 gigahertz, which is used in these countries, 2.4 gigahertz, 5 gigahertz, 700 megahertz, and so on and so forth. All right, so every country would have different. The key is that while the IEEE 16, 802.16, I mean, will apply to all of these until WiMAX forum standardizes for a particular spectrum, you cannot get interoperable products. So that is the problem, is that if you go to a WiMAX forum, it is not supporting all of these right now. It will support someday, because, but, but they have most important thing first. Obviously, guess in this list, what is most important for them? 2.3. So 2.3 has been done, but let's say 2.3 is not available in India. Right? So the Indian government is coming to WiMAX firm and saying, please, please, please standardize 3.6 or 3.5 and things like that. And they're saying, okay, we'll take our time, we'll do it. And so that is what is happening, is that while these are the options, not all of the options are supported by WiMAX forum. Now, what is the effect of frequency? Why would you select one thing versus the other? If you had a choice, not uh, many of us have a choice, but the governments have a choice. So when a government sits down and says, well, what should be allocated, where should be allocated, they do have a choice, right? So <clears throat> for example, 700 megahertz just became available in US last year. However, all of it was bought by AT&T and Verizon, and so they're not going to make WiMAX in that band, all right? It's a very good band. Um, so what is the effect? Well, higher frequencies have higher attenuation. So basically, they can go shorter distances. Higher frequencies have higher attenuation. For the same power, they will go shorter distances. Uh, so for example, if you use 18 gigahertz, it will have 20 dB per meter more attenuation than 1.8 gigahertz. 
So that's why 700 is better than 2.3. 700 megahertz is better than 2.3 gigahertz. Higher frequencies need a smaller antenna, but the higher frequencies means wavelength is small. The antenna size is half the wavelength, so that is smaller. So if you use lower frequencies like 900 megahertz or you know something like that, the antennas are so big. <coughs> Obviously, you know you can't use those. Although now the antenna technology has improved so that you don't really need an antenna extender like this, even if the wavelength is one meter and you need a half meter antenna, but they have made designs where they coil the antenna or they make a plate which does something. So there are ways of putting the antenna inside a cell phone. That's whole new technology. But generally the higher antennas, um, they need uh, higher, uh, higher frequencies need smaller antennas. So that is better. Higher frequencies are affected more by the weather. So we already saw 28 gigahertz, same thing applies to 10 gigahertz, 60 gigahertz and so on and so forth. So that is one problem with the 60 gigahertz, we just talked about the millimeter waves. Indoor there is no problem, but outdoor it depends upon the weather. Higher frequencies have more bandwidth and higher data rate. Obviously at 60 gigahertz you can get 10 gigahertz of a spectrum, but you cannot get 10 gigahertz of a spectrum at 2.4 gigahertz. So there you can get megahertz. If you come to 900 megahertz, you get their kilohertz. So as you come down in the lower band, you get less and less width. High frequencies allows more frequency reuse because they attenuate close. So because they cannot go, high frequency cannot go very far, your cells are smaller. And so the same band you can use, you know, multiple times. All right. Whereas the lower frequency, if you use 700 megahertz, it will go kilometers away. You cannot use the same frequency again for several kilometers away. Right? Cell size have to be bigger. Um, actually, cell size can be smaller, but you cannot use the same frequency again. So you have to use some other channel. So you use this much here in the 700 megahertz band, and that some other frequency for the next cell. And Below 10 gigahertz, mobility is good. If you want to move, then you have to be at um, lower bands because at higher bands, if you are moving, then uh, the whole, you can do the math yourself about the um, Doppler effect that they will have a lot more effect. All right? So we have to stay below 10 gigahertz uh, for that. All right. So A22.16 actually experimented, let me put it this way, experimented with many different ways of doing this thing. So when it started first, when it first started, it started in 10 to 66 gigahertz band. And that standard was called wireless man single carrier. And they didn't even use OFDM. That was the first standard back in 2000. As soon as the standard came out, it was out of date because first of all, nobody wanted to use that frequency and the single carrier does not allow enough mobility and so on and so forth. It was line of sight. So all, it has all the negative things. So even though the standard exists, it never really saw the, day of the uh, light of the day. Then they made another standard which was at better frequencies, 2.11, 2, sorry, 2 to 11 gigahertz, and um, but it's still it was still single carrier, and so that was also not it didn't go very far. Then they made a third standard that was 256 carriers, and now it used OFDM, so that is called 16D. This is called 16A, by the way. This is called 16, 16A, 16D. Then that was implemented actually. That's when the WiMAX forum was born and they started implementing it. This is non line of sight, it uses OFDM and so on and so forth. However, still the mobility was not there. And therefore, they had to go for higher number of carriers so that the symbols become bigger and then you can use more mobility. Uh, so, higher number of carriers 
and um, and and so that was called 16e all right and uh, so 16e is what is today being sold in the marketplace then there is a standard called wireless human which is license exempt so this is license exempt part of WiMAX where anybody can just use 2.4 gigahertz band so while this is a standard again is there is nobody making any equipment in that band because to cover these big distances you really need a carrier and then the carriers really need a licensed spectrum so that nobody else can use it so again this is more of a theoretical so many of these actually most of these are theoretical except for 16d and 16e all right there is one more now so last year IEEE came out with 16m 16m is much higher speed than 16e but the standard has just come out WiMAX forum has not even started working on it or they will start working on it now so the products will come out in a few years so one of you is doing I, I think is it you who is doing WiMAX so you, you missed the last class so I don't know you are doing WiMAX your report has to be totally on 16M alright because the rest of the technologies have been very well understood and there are books on 16E and D and A and B and C so I mean you don't really want to you want to read those books so that you understand what these are but your paper has to concentrate on 16M all right uh, so that is the next generation by max all right so how does it um, what does it use and it turns out that we have used most of these features right in the five lectures so i took it away from this lecture and put it into the five lecture and we already know what is a scalable ofdma anybody remembers what is a scalable ofdma what is scalable about this ofdma yeah, it scales with the bandwidth of the carrier. So first, if suppose you have 10 megahertz given, then you have so many carriers. If you have 20 megahertz given, you have twice as many carriers. So the inter-carrier spacing remains the same. That is scalable FDMA. It uses TDD and FDD. So what is good about TDD? Yes, what is good about it? Yeah, you can vary the up and down, right? But what is bad about it? What is it? Half duplex. Half duplex, okay. There is one more bigger thing than that. It requires synchronization between the stations. So if there are two cells which have TDD, they have to both have same time up and down. They can't be doing up and down at different times. Then we have adaptive modulation and coding. Adaptive modulation coding is where you, if you are far away, we give you one coding. If you are close, we give you another coding, right? So the closer you are, we can give you more what? Bits per hertz, right? It has that. It has space-time block codes. It has adaptive antenna systems. So we have talked about all of these. Um, basically, this is um, adaptive antenna systems is that directional antennas and then um, where you can change the direction uh, at the spur of a moment. And then you have um, other features which we have not discussed that, that we'll discuss in this, this lecture today is, um, is uh, sub-channelization, permutation, slots, tiles, clusters, and bursts. So some of these things we have to discuss here today because the same things are done in, in LTE. All right, so those are becoming the new ways of doing things and um, they are being done in other metropolitan area networks all right so so those are the key features now the frequency reuse this is a standard thing this is done in the cellular network where you divide the whole area that you want to cover the whole city into cells each cell has sectors so for example this cell here has three sectors 120 degrees 120 degrees 120 degrees three sectors right now in each sector you could use a different frequency or you could use the same frequency so you could have one antenna which covers this 120 degrees and has a red frequency this one uses a green frequency this is a blue frequency whatever num number uh, you know you could just um, have right so when you have a system like this there is a way to name this system 
and the system is named as n times s times k where n is the number of cells per cluster so what happens is you form a number of cells which in which let's say five, one cell or seven cells or 15 cells over which basically you will use your one set of frequencies and then you will have another cluster you can reuse the same set of frequencies over the next cluster so that is the number of cells in the cluster s is the number of sectors in a cell like shown here and k is the number of frequency allocated in the number in the cell so even though you have three sectors you may have three frequencies or you may not have three frequencies all right so let's see examples this is 1 by 3 by 1. What we have done is we have taken, we have only one frequency and we are going to divide each cell into three sectors and use the same frequency. Right? So each cluster is one cell. Each cell has three sectors and only one frequency in the whole cell. This is another example just opposite of that is 1 by 1 by 1. Here we have cell and we have only one frequency and only one sector per cell. So each cell is using the same frequency. This is an example of 1 by 3 by 3. Here we have one cell divided into three sectors, each of them using different frequencies. We have three frequencies. So 1 by 3 by 3. This is 3 by 1, this is 3 by 3, this is 3 by 3 by 3. So you can just verify that notation well there is more to frequency reuse than just using the whole cell some people came up with the idea that we don't really worry about um, interference in the center of the cell we have to worry about the interference in the edges of the cell so in the edges of the cell we use a frequency which is different but in the center of the cell we can use all the frequencies so that is called fractional frequency reuse where you use all the frequencies in the center of the cell, but as you go to the edges, you only transmit to the edges frequencies that do not collide with the frequencies of the other cells. Is this clear? <coughs> right? Okay. So, so much about the frequency reuse. Now we are going to change the topic to the next thing which is different about Bimax. Again, this is some of these things are very first for Bimax is how do we use the subcarriers? So now we divided, this is our spectrum. We divide it into thousands of subcarriers. And then what do we do? First thing we do is we need to have some guard band. So there are some carriers at the end which are not used. All right, at all. So those, those are guard bands. So even though the spectrum is given to us, we don't use it so that we don't spill over into some other because these frequencies might move a little bit with the Doppler effect and with the Doppler effect we don't want to affect other people right so so these are not used these are guard bands then the then the other ones some of them we use as pilot and the pilot is a measuring frequency so basically we send some known data on those carriers and if we don't get the same data, then we know there's an error. So we can measure how good is that frequency, how good is that carrier. All right, so that is pilot. The rest of them are used for data, except one in the center, which is basically direct current, which is just used as a reference point. So, so basically, rest of them are data. All right. So we have pilots, we have guard, we have DC, and we have data. Those are the four types of carriers. But the interesting thing in WiMAX was that these things, the at least the data and the pilot, are not fixed. So they will use some frequencies as pilot for a few milliseconds, and then they will say, now we are going to use them for data, and then these data frequencies some other data frequencies will be selected for pilot. So the pilots keep rotating. The pilot job keeps rotating. That way we can measure all carriers. So every carrier is used as pilot for a little while and then it is used as a data carrier. Okay, is that clear? That the pilot job is not fixed. So if I showed you that the fifth frequency is a pilot, it is not the fifth frequency. 
Fourth frequency will also get the same job. Sixth frequency will also get the same job. The pilot keeps rotating. Obviously, the guards and the DC cannot rotate. So those remain fixed. Now, how do we form the channels out of these things? This is another new idea. Is that if we have 2,000 carriers, we could just say that the first 500 is channel 1 and the next 500 is the channel 2 and so on and so forth. All right, why do we need the channel in the first place? Well, channel is the unit of a location. Basically, we don't want to give people 213 carriers. We want to give them some nice number of carriers, let me put it this way, some even number, some so nice number, you know, 64, 52, whatever number. So we can give them only one channel at a time, or one, or two, or three, some multiple of one. And so each channel is some number of carriers. Now we could, so let's say we divided this into 30 channels. So then 30 channels could be that we could just take the first 130th, second 130th, third 130th, and that could be channel. Well, that was the old way of doing things. With Vimax, they said, no, 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 we need to rem we need to give these channels which are really widespread and they are also rotating. So channel number one, for example, is the red ones that's shown here. So the channel number one is everywhere. This carrier, that carrier, that carrier, that carrier, that carrier, that is channel number one. All right? But just like pilots, Channel number one also keeps rotating. So that is channel number one this millisecond. After a few milliseconds, some other group will become channel one, and this will become channel two. So this is like frequency hopping. All right? So the channel one user who has been allocated to channel one will be using these carriers for this time, but in the next slot, it might be using different carriers, even though it is on channel one. Right? So that was basically they combined the channelization with frequency hopping and um, so the ch sub channels are located based upon the user's uh, SINR. So SINR is the signal to interference noise ratio, signal to interference and noise ratio. So what was the interference and noise? Um, if, if you are have it, you, you are given, you, you can be given better channels depending upon where you are and um, and so this is the opposite of that op opposite of this would have been fixed <coughs> channelization which actually is called band amc band amc is where you make a band you can say well, this band is for user one channel one this band is channel two and they made it fixed um, and amc stands for modulation encoding um, so that b band um, AMC, A is for adaptive. So band AMC, actually the name is misleading because band AMC says ma band adaptive modulation encoding. It's not really adaptive, it is fixed in this sense. Whereas if you move the carriers around and then it is good for moving users. So mobile users would much prefer things where they are getting different carriers than being fixed at one carrier, one location. So this is, what I just described to you is called permutation. Um, where the sub-carriers are randomly assigned to a channel and every single time we are changing the carriers and that is, this is like frequency hopping. So this is called permutation and, um, and so Partial usage of subcarriers is what is what I have just described is, and then all subcarriers are used. That is called full usage of carriers, and that is not used. So all subcarriers are used. So here we have 2024. Not all will be used. Only partial are used, and then they are rotated. So all will be get used at the end, but not at the same time. So this PUSC is what is in the Vimax program profiles, and that is what is used. All right. So the key is that the permutation means frequency hopping. The channel is frequency hopping. Okay. Is that part clear as to how the frequency hopping happens? Right. So the set of carriers that make a channel changes at every slot. 
just like it was doing in Bluetooth. In Bluetooth, we had only one channel, right? And we change the frequency. Here, we have 30 carriers, right? So all 30 carriers are, are hopping. <coughs> um, so PUSC. Mm. The power is not on. Actually, we didn't turn on the power today. Okay, hold on. This is the master plug which is out. Now, can you? Can you find the power source and connect it over there on the other side? Maybe here. There's another one there. Okay, let's see. Does it make any difference anywhere? It is on. This is on. Okay. Let's see if the power came on anywhere. Um, how do we know? Now this one is on. This is on. This one beeped, so I think this is okay. This one is showing power. Okay, all right, we are set. So where are we? Okay, PUSC. <coughs> so PUSC, subcarriers are divided into six groups. Now, this is some detail that you don't have to remember, by the way. I can't remember it myself. However, you have to know the concept, all right? So I, there are many numbers on this slide which you may not be able to remember, but you have to remember the concept that these things are changing. So basically, I'm just giving you some, uh, some things here so that you know how these things work. So we have 1024 or you know, so many, so many subcarriers that are divided into six groups and only some groups may be used in a sector or a cell. All right? And so it's, when we say f uh, frequency F1 and F2 and F3, that is what this sum, sum means, that you know we might be g given the whole band, but we will use only some part of it in this sector, some part in this sector. Now, these two parts are not contiguous parts. They are some subset, right? Some carriers taken randomly, right? So some so divided into six groups, and only some groups are used in a sector as a cell. The data and pilots are arranged in cluster of 14 subcarriers over two symbols. So this slide will show you more detail as to how that happens. But we take 14 subcarriers over two symbols, and that makes um, that makes. Um, 24 data symbols and four pilot symbols. And again, maybe I should go to the next slide anyway and show it to you. So here is what we have shown here, time and y-axis is frequency. So there are um, car subcarriers here and we could have, let's say, 1024 subcarriers. If we have 10 megahertz, we have 1024 subcarriers. Out of them, 840 subcarriers plus one DC plus 183 guard. So out of 1024 FFT, only 840 subcarriers are left. All right. What we do is we divide that into sub 30 sub channels by dividing 30 times 28. So there are 28 subcarriers here, 14 and 14. And the time is divided into slots. So we take two slots. So this is called a cluster. A 14 subcarriers times two symbols, 14 subcarriers vertically, two subcarriers horizontally, this thing is called a cluster. And so we have now how many symbols? We have two symbols, two symbols, two symbols. So we have 28 symbols here. Some of these symbols are used as pilot. So the squares ones are pilot and the circular ones are data. So you can see this is a pilot. This is a pilot, this is a pilot, this is a pilot. Four pilots and 24 data. All right. Similarly, we take this other one. We have 14 by 2, four pilots and 24 data. So that's another cluster. And these two clusters make up a slot. All right. So every user can be given only some multiple of slots. You cannot be given half a slot. So you are given one slot two slots, four slots, five slots, whatever number, of individual number of slots. Each slot is two clusters. Each cluster is 14 by 2. 
and each 14 by 2 has only 24 data symbols and two pilot symbols. All right, why all this complex arrangement? Because this way nobody is stuck in one position actually all of these are changing by the way these 14 sub carriers are hopping right so each user actually is hopping all right and this is the minimum amount because then we have some some arrangement by which we can allocate rather than allocating 2000 by <coughs> 1024 by whatever number here combinations that becomes too much to allocate so it becomes much better in terms of um, actually more more from the file layer point of view uh, it becomes much better because everybody is hopping and so they're not stuck in a bad position so the clusters are renumbered okay now so data and pilots are arranged in clusters of 14 over two symbols that gives you 24 data and four pilots clusters are renumbered using a pseudo random number numbering scheme and then the clusters are divided into six groups so the clusters are numbered, cluster number 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, but they are not numbered just like the carriers are not numbered 1, 2, 3, 4, 5 con consecutively, they are randomly numbered. So number 1, this is number 3, number 2 and so on and so forth. But all the numbers will be assigned. And they are divided into 6 groups and that is the segment, 6 groups here. So they, they are called segments 0 through 5 and then a sub channel is two clusters from the same group so if you take two clusters like we showed in the next slide that is a channel sub channel and it is allocated to possible some subset of the groups to each transmitter in a cell so two groups per sector so the key idea of doing this group business is that if you have six groups you could have six sectors okay so this sector is using first group this sector is using second group and so on and so forth if you have three sectors then you could use two groups per sector if you have only one sector then you could give all the six groups to that sector right so this is how we do frequency division among the sectors of the cell all right now each sorry each sub channel is this right 14 sub carriers so everything is random so basically what is happening is that if you are given this much band you divide that into six parts and then you use one part here one part there one part there but these parts are all very overlapping in the sense that they're all hopping all right so you cannot just say that i'm using the first one sixth and second one sixth and third one sixth everything is randomly merged together there's a lot of uh, randomness here so i don't know whether that is clear but basically we divide the whole thing into many pieces and then we divide into channels and uh, uh, and um, and segments as we call it segments is more for sectors and then in each segment we have sub channels inside sub channels we have slots all right each slot now here is two wide long but anyway, all this is for downlink all right and all of this is what we call partial uses and this is what is specified by vimax forum and therefore um, all the vimax devices will use this kind of definition in the uplink is slightly different in the uplink is different because the whole thing uplink is the one which goes from the mobile to this access point uh, mobile to the base station the power levels are different there is a collision and so on and so forth so anyway so um, the here they divided into tiles each tile is three symbol times on the horizontal axis over um, basically um, four sub carriers and 24 sub carriers make a channel so you have um, a slot which is six tiles so a user is cannot be given less than a slot and when they are given a slot they get the whole sub channel over three symbol periods and then they hop off basically after every slot the carriers will change even though the user will remain on the same sub channel but the carriers that make those sub channels will change 
anyway the number of um, pilots is 4 out of 12 so there are a lot more pilots 4 by 3 is 12 out of 12 4 are used as pilot and, and the 8 are used as data so there are a lot more pilots in going upwards so if you have 10 megahertz you divide that into 1024 FFT out of that 840 subcarriers 1 DC and 183 guard total 35 sub channels and those 35 are 35 times 24 that makes 840 and so on and so forth all right so as I said uh, you have to remember some mi minimum things and minimum things are that you have to remember slots all right you have to remember that each slot you know is um, is you cannot give less than a slot either up down up level or down level right that you cannot give less than one sub channel that the sub channels basically hop you know these facts have to be important and and many of these numbers if you need to you can look them up right all right so, so much about how this whole frequency hopping happens and how the pilots and the data are you know, kind of continuously changing then oh we are already in time I'm sorry we are done um, so Lee when you were absent in the last class we assigned the project